Why are they collecting the bins right now? Why are they collecting the bins right now? Why do they have to collect the bins right now? Why do they have to collect the bins? Every YouTube person that exists is in a constant battle with urban infrastructure. Today I want to talk about a question that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Is gender individual or social? And by that I mean, is gender something that happens mainly on our own, on an individual, personal level? Or is it something that happens socially, embedded in our relationships with the world and the people around us? As usual, this video is going to be a mixture of some academic ideas, some lived experience, and also just some vibes that I've gathered from being a queer person on the internet. If you've never seen my face before, my name's Tallulah, my pronouns are they, them, and I sporadically share semi-academic brain dumps about gender, sexuality, and identity. And if you're coming back to my channel, then I want to thank you for your patience during these months of radio silence. I finished my degree, started a job, and released a single. But now, I am back. <laughs> but now let's get back to the reason why we're here. The question of whether gender identity is individual or social. I want to start this video by painting a picture of two competing perspectives on this question. Now these two perspectives are definitely not representative of what people in both of these camps that I'm vaguely trying to illustrate think, they're just a rough introduction to start thinking about the different ideas that are being thrown around when it comes to the question of individual versus social. Perspective 1 is brought to you by one of many flavours of feminist gender theorist. Gender is social, that's clear. We're told it's something we're born with, some feature of our nature, which is a very convenient idea for misogynists who want to suggest that women are naturally weak or illogical. In actual fact, gender is a series of learned behaviours and aesthetics that we constantly perform, and it only remains such an important category in our society because we all buy into it and affirm it for one another. And as much as we might feel a profound connection to a particular gender, something that I am all for respecting, we have to remember that gender is ultimately about roles and behaviour. It's not some intangible element of our souls. We'll cycle back to our gender theorist in due course, but first I want to give you our second perspective, brought to you by one of many flavours of trans non-binary activist. Gender is a part of who you are. It's totally personal and there's endless room for diversity. When trans and non-binary people take steps to live as our authentic selves, it's not about conforming to gender norms and stereotypes, it's about that individual person being who they really are. Now cis feminists love to tell us that we should just do away with gender altogether, as if it's nothing but oppressive roles and norms, but gender is so much more than that. It's about identity, and you can't just turn that off. I'm doing this for me, not for anybody else's approval. As I've hinted at with this incredibly low-budget contrapoints moment, there is some debate about whether gender identity is individual or social. And in my view, just as some gender theorists can be too rigid on this topic, so too can trans and non-binary activists get pretty defensive. And I can understand where this defensiveness comes from. If you're constantly being told that your experience of gender can't be real, and bombarded with fear-mongering ideas about rapid-onset gender dysphoria and children being forced to transition in order to conform to gender stereotypes, you're going to focus on a narrative that prioritises individual agency and authenticity. I believe it's partly for this reason why so many activists focus on the most individual aspects of their journey, such as how comfortable they feel in their bodies after a particular affirming procedure, for example. But there has to be more to it than this if only for the simple fact that humans are social creatures, and we cannot and do not live in isolation. I recently had a conversation with my therapist about how, as a non-binary person, I live with the knowledge that most of the time when somebody meets me for the first time or sees me in passing, they're going to unconsciously misgender me in their heads. And that feels heavy to me sometimes, even though I live a very privileged life compared to many other queer people. And she said that it was no surprise that not being seen felt like a weight. After all, as people, we need to have ourselves reflected back at us by others. It's how we feel connected to our place in the world, it's how we build relationships, and it's how we form a sense of self-assurance. So as much as I can gain a greater knowledge of myself, and share that with those closest to me, I still have a deeply social need to be seen as who I am, not as who I am incorrectly assumed to be. Thinking back to our generic feminist gender theorist, 
She said that gender is something we all affirm for one another, social cues we've learnt to respond to. And while I disagree that gender is nothing more than roles and social cues, it makes sense that gender is something profoundly social. It's something we all do in relation to one another. And this is a big part of why being misgendered can feel so upsetting and destabilizing. It means that whether consciously or unconsciously, somebody is not seeing us. We are not being reflected back at ourselves. So what does this mean for our generic trans non-binary activist? They told us that they aren't transitioning and living as themselves for other people. They are only doing it for themselves. This is clearly true in one sense. They are on a deeply personal journey of exploring what makes them feel at home in their mind and body. It's unlikely that anybody is imposing this path upon them. In fact, they're more likely to be facing opposition than forceful support, and that through it, they have an internal sense that this is what is right for them. And I can relate to what they're saying. I've spent a lot of time sitting with myself, questioning and exploring my gender, and if anything, trying to block out the world, what I've been taught and what's expected of me. But there came a time when I needed to road test what I was feeling. And that meant inviting other people to see me through the lens through which I had been seeing myself. And experiencing being seen by others, being referred to in new ways, having myself reflected back at me, was just as important and revelatory as all of that time I spent introspecting. After nearly two years of openly being non-binary, I wish that I could provide myself with all the gender affirmation that I need. But sometimes, being misgendered, not being seen, it gets heavy and I realise more than ever just how much the social life of my gender matters. I am doing this for me, but I can't do it alone. Something that really frustrates me is that the desire of trans and or non-binary people to be treated and viewed as the gender we are is sometimes framed as needy, demanding, or even perverse. But this perspective just reveals the privilege of the cis people who promote it, the privilege of automatically being seen as the gender you are. Cis people might not ever experience being misgendered, being referred to by their dead name, or being asked invasive questions about their body and identity. It may sound strange to a cis person that a trans man or transmasculine person might get excited when a barista calls them sir, but that's only because equivalent experiences are something they take for granted. So what's the answer? Is gender identity individual or social? As is often the case with these big complex questions, the broad stroke answer is both. Gender identity is often experienced as a strongly held internal sense of self. But we also move through the world as gendered beings, and we rely on one another for affirmation and a sense of belonging. Rather than treating this video like an undergraduate anthropology essay and leaving you with a classic but infuriating it's complicated, I want to end this video with a model of gender that I personally really like. Meg John Barker is an academic, author and therapist with a huge brain, and in one of their free zines they advocate for the idea that gender is biopsychosocial. So rather than arguing over which neat category gender can fall into, they want to open the conversation. By saying that gender is biopsychosocial, we're saying that gender is biological, so experienced through and in relation to our physical bodies, psychological, experienced from the perspective of our minds and internal worlds, and social, embedded in our social relationships and interactions. Some may say that this model is lazy because of how broad it is, but I think it has to be this broad, because removing any one of these three aspects leaves you with an incomplete picture. Take our bodies or biology out of the picture, and we're left without our physical selves, the embodied thing that carries us through the world and can't really be separated from who we are and what we go through. Ignore our inner worlds or psychology, and we're planes without pilots. Our sense of self lies at least partly in our minds. And as we've already established, without the social dimension, we can't really talk about any aspect of being a person, because we're always existing in relation to one another. If I had to choose a gender theory hill to die on, this one would definitely be up there. It captures a broad range of experiences, it doesn't privilege any one aspect over the other, and it resists the urge to seek a simple answer. At the heart of my perspective is this. To say that gender is only social ignores gender as an identity, and to say that gender is only individual ignores gender as a system. I'm sorry, but if you wanted a simple answer, you really shouldn't have listened to an anthropology graduate wearing one earring. That's it from me today. I really hope you enjoyed the video and maybe even learned something new. I'd love to keep the conversation going in the comments down below, so run forth and share the contents of your juicy brains. I've also linked some freely accessible resources in the description down below if you're as much of a nerd about this stuff as I am and you'd like to do a little bit more research. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye!